everyone, welcome back to Art à la Carte. And this video is going to be a time-lapse video of a painting that I did last month. And I thought I would kind of do a bit of a, what was I thinking while I was creating this? I always think it's fun to step inside the creative mind and find out what a person is thinking about or the process, thought process when they create a piece. Things like this that are finished pieces, it's, well, one is challenging to do an actual tutorial, like step-by-step -step how to draw this. And two, as an artist, you don't want to ever take um, a piece and create it exactly as another artist uh, did. You want to be able to create your own piece. So definitely take inspiration from any of my drawings here, but I won't be doing a step-by-step -step tutorial for this. I have lots of different videos on how to draw people and how to do painting and all that. Those videos be able to create a piece like this. Uh, what I'm doing first right now is just coming up with kind of a conceptual drawing, an idea of what I want. And uh, what I did first, and I didn't show this on the camera, is I just went and looked at a bunch of pictures of ponds. I wanted to do a mermaid that was in a pond not an ocean and I wanted to do it from perspective of looking underneath the water and looking up and seeing like lily pads and things growing up above her because um, I've never tried that before and I really liked the color scheme that I was choosing I wanted to be a little bit more of a greens and browns instead of like blues and things that you would see often in um, ocean type pictures of mermaids so then I decided that I would design uh, my mermaid character and did a couple different sketches and I didn't want I didn't want her to look like um, a typical mermaid. I wanted her to look almost like a goldfish mermaid. And I don't know if I actually achieved what I see in my mind. I might give this another go later on to create a goldfish mermaid. Um, but I liked how she turned out. I also gave her kind of a little bit of an Asian um, look because I wanted it to be kind of like a koi pond. So she's kind of like a koi mermaid. And I really encourage you guys to to do that. If you find yourself drawing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, um, change a little something up about it. Uh, something that would make it a little bit more unique. So once I finished inking this piece in, then I thought, okay, let's begin to add color. And I knew at the very beginning of this picture that I wanted to use watercolor, so I have it on some Bristol board. And that's also something you're going to want to think about before you start creating a finished piece is what ultimately do you want to do with it. If I was going to do a colored pencils, I would use a paper that would be that would work better with colored pencils, as opposed to paper that um, works better with watercolor. So I knew I wanted to do watercolor, but I'm also going to put in some highlights and textures with colored pencils. So I didn't use straight watercolor board. Um, that's why I went with the Bristol because Bristol kind of is a, a great uh, go-to that takes just about everything. You can do watercolor. You can do colored pencils, you can um, do markers, all those kind of things on it. Um, it. It picks it up pretty well. So with the, the mermaid herself, I wanted to lay in some base color first. I'm not going to go into a lot of shadows and highlights at this stage. I'm just putting in the flat color. I don't want to get too dark because it'll be really hard to bring out highlights later on. So I'm going to start light and then slowly build in my shadows and values and um, contrasting colors and things like that. With working on this kind of paper though, you want to be careful not to add a lot of water at one time, otherwise you're going to experience your paper buckling. So if you're creating a piece with watercolor and you see it kind of getting wrinkly and bubbly looking and, the, and like it's not laying flat on your on your table. Um, that's because it's absorbed way too much water too quickly and the fibers of the paper have expanded causing your paper to do what we call as buckling. As I'm doing a large stretch of watercolor for the background, I, I put it on a little at a time and kind of let that dry before I get to blend out more colors. Um, and it's kind of this dance because you don't want it to dry too much because then your colors don't blend. Um, so you, you just have to really know your paper and that just comes from working with it and messing it up and having your paper buckle and warp and know exactly how much water you can put on this paper before it starts to act up on you. That's, I can't tell you how much to use before your paper will do that. You just have to try it out and see for yourself. So now I'm at the point where I want to begin to add in some textures for the background. I want to kind of give that, it wouldn't be seaweed, but it'd be kind of that algae that's on the bottom of fish ponds if you ever go walking and go, this is squishing between my toes. That's the stuff right there. It's kind of, you know, their version of seaweed, but it's pond, so it's pond weed. <laughs> uh, and again, I'm not going for a lot of detail. I just want to kind of give a little bit of background 
texture. So now I'm taking the plunge. I'm not exactly certain how I want to create these lily pads uh, view from the from the looking up underneath them looking up. And so this is the point you just have to take a deep breath and go, I'm gonna try. And it may totally ruin this picture. It may not. At this point, I have no clue. Um, but sometimes you just have to do that. If you are nervous about ruining a piece that you're working on, um, get a second piece of paper and just practice that element on that paper. So in this case, I would grab a second piece of paper and kind of paint in some water and then just begin to try out uh, painting those lily pads. And that way I can make my mistakes and learn from it without ruining this piece. But I walk on the wild side and I, you know, that's part of the fun for me is trying not to ruin my piece. So on this one, I thought I'm just going to try it. So I did. And it turned out it, it, I still learned a lot from it and I messed up a few times, but I was able to kind of fix them. Um, but, uh, but in the end, I liked how the piece turned out. It, it worked out well. It was turning a little bit too blue, so I added a little bit more of my yellow highlights. I wanted a lot of, like the sun was like beating down on the water and kind of just making it that murky gold color that you see in, in, in fish ponds. But I did want that nice contrasting colors of blues and greens in there as well. But I wanted the overall color to be kind of greenish, yellowish, goldenish, orangish, colorish, nish, nish, ish. <laughs> So lots and lots and lots and lots of layers and time. I think this piece overall took, I painted on it all day. Um, and I think in active working time, it took me roughly about three hours from start to finish. And for a watercolor, that's that's taking a little, that's a little time for me. Um, I generally, when I'm working with a watercolor piece, will... Um, not take very many breaks with it. I won't put it aside for um, a day or two because it's really hard for me to come back to that. Case in point, if you guys have watched my Clockwork Fox picture, you know I took a break to kind of think about the background and lo and behold, like how many months later, six months later, I'm still thinking about the background um, just because it's, it's uh, I have so many other paintings that I want to think about. Uh, but I will, I will work on that picture. Once the picture has completely dried and is ready for colored pencils, then I begin to add in uh, the layers of colored pencils. And this is now where I'm going to start really focusing on the texture and the details and the highlights and the shines and reflecting and, and all that fun stuff. So again, working really slowly, building up my colors, not using just one color to color a certain area. I'm using wide varieties of tones of yellows and oranges and reds and creams and all this to begin to blend those out. And you'll see I, I even use like other colors for the shadows like purples and blues and grays for, for the shadows to just begin to bring in some um, variance in there. And it just, I don't know, adds a little bit of something to the drawing. It's a little bit. So with the fins, I didn't want it to be super... Um, opaque where you couldn't see through it. I wanted some nice transparency in there. So really wanted to work to kind of try to get that. I don't know how well I achieved that, but it was good practice. The underside of her fin, I wanted to be kind of a creamy white like you would see in a koi fish. So added lots of blues and creams to kind of get that shadows there. With the textures and shadows on her, on her face and her, uh, you know, torso and arms, um, I started off with just adding a little bit of darker skin tone and then would go back in with a lighter color and kind of blend that out. But you'll see I'll also throw in some other different colors. I threw in some greens and some purples and blues um, to kind of add in a little bit more interest to the shadow so that's just not one toned by itself. It's a lot of different tones. I use my colorist blender to kind of help blend in the colors. You can either use a colorist blender or a white color pencil to do blending. The thing is, is your white color pencil is going to lighten your colors, obviously, because you're using a white color pencil. 
where if you use a colorless blender, it actually deepens the colors a little bit because it pushes it down. It, it uh, pushes the actual color pencil residue into the crevices of the paper, which doesn't then allow the white of the paper to kind of show through. So then you get that true, true color of the color pencil. So it really kind of, it almost looks like it darkens it. So you kind of have to decide if you want your piece to look a little darker in that area or if you want it to be lighter in that area would be where you would choose to either use a color pencil uh, in a white or a cream or if you want to use your colorless blender. Now for the hair I'm adding in the black but I really want to be able to keep the shine and highlights in my hair so you'll see that as I'm coloring it I'm leaving gaps of where locks of hair would kind of be pulling forward. So the darker areas are things that are pushed back and the lighter areas are parts that are coming forward a little bit. And then you'll see that I'm doing a little bit of the highlighting with my white color pencil instead of my colorless blender. If I did it with my colorless blender, it would pull the residue of the color pencil across everything and it would just ruin what I did. So using the white color pencil kind of helps to blend that out a little bit. For the darker areas, I went ahead and pulled in a kind of a really vibrant blue and that would blend my darker shades of, of black in her hair, but would just give a hint of, of a blue tone to that. And I think it turned out really, really nice. I liked that it uh, sometimes just using black in a certain area kind of maybe deadens your picture a little bit, um, but if you use a darker shade, like a dark green or a dark brown or a dark blue or a dark purple, um, it just adds a little bit of life into that, a little color into it, and I like how it turned out. So with these pictures, what do I do with them after I finish them? And that's, you know, something that every artist has to kind of think about. Maybe you have to think about that with pictures that you do. Um, a lot of artists will have um, sketchbooks that they put their pictures into or the inevitable art box where you keep all of your art pieces. Um, I, I do sell my original pieces. I'm starting not to sell as many as I used to. Um, I'm holding on to them a little bit more. So another thing I'm getting into is uh, selling prints is the next thing I want to start getting into. Um, for one, uh, prints come in a lot of different sizes so that it's easier for people to, who would, you know, maybe would like a, a picture uh, or one of my pieces but maybe don't have the wall space for it. They can choose a smaller print or some of my pieces are small and I can get a really nice quality print and have it enlarged so you can get a nicer size to that. And so it gives a nice variety to match uh, with what people are asking for. And also it's a lot more affordable for people. Art can be very expensive to purchase because um, sometimes it, it, you know, hours and hours worth of work goes into one piece and um, that can be, that can be spendy to buy the original. So I am hoping to possibly start selling more prints um, in the new year. I do have a Redbubble shop where I do have some of my pieces out there, but those prints are even kind of a little on the expensive side sometimes. I like my red bubble shop because I can get my artwork put on things um, that I couldn't do myself. Like I can get it on stickers and I can get it on cups and notebooks and you know all sorts of different fun things. Tote bags and sweatshirts and things like that. So that's kind of fun. I haven't bought a sweatshirt with my artwork on it yet because I can't decide which one I want. <laughs> I want them all. <laughs> So as I get closer to the end of this video, you'll see it's mainly just a lot of time putting in uh, layers and layers and layers of color. And um, it's something that you don't want to rush. So if you know you're going to do a large piece like this, uh, be, pre be prepared to put in, you know, hours and hours and hours worth of work into it. Because if you rush through a piece like this, you might catch the idea of it, but it'll miss out on so much if, you, if it's rushed. Not that every piece takes, you know, days and days to do. You can do an amazing piece in an hour, if you know what you're, you know, depending on your style. Um, but for something with color pencils and watercolor, you might want to be able to put a lot of time into that. Usually, when, if I'm going to do a big piece like this, I give myself a good five hour time block to be able to work on it. And sometimes I can finish them in that amount of time. Um, other times I do have to take a break and come back the next day and work on it, but I enjoy it. So there you go, a little thoughts in my head as I was working on this piece, um, and hopefully you found it uh, entertaining and insightful and inspiring. Hopefully this makes you want to pull out your paints and 
colored pencils and create your own cool piece. Love to see it. Make sure to post those on your Instagram page. Tag me in it. Um, or you can go over to my Facebook page and send me one in a private message. I would love to see it. A lot of people put them on my wall. I try to see as many as I possibly can on my wall, but sometimes it gets overwhelmed with pictures and I don't get to see them all. So if you definitely want me to see it, send it to me in a private message or tag it or tag me in an Instagram photo and I probably will see it. Yay! If you enjoyed this piece and want to see some of my other artwork, check out my Redbubble and Etsy shop um, for more artwork fun. Well, thank you guys for hanging out with me and until next time, God bless you guys and we'll see you later. Bye-bye!